watched the movie last night. Nope, I'm, I've got my own pack, yep. Good evening, everyone. I'm April Lighty with the New Walm Public Library. I want to thank you for coming to tonight's program and welcome you. Um, this program is part of the U.S. Dakota War Week of Commemorative Events, which was organized by the Brown County Historical Society and New Walm Public Library. We invite you to join us tomorrow at noon for I fin I excuse me, a financial outlook on the Dakota War with Dan Munson, which will be presented at the Brown County Historical Society Annex. Can you turn um, up the volume a little bit, ma'am? Oh. Yep. You might have to do that in the, the back. Um, we have many other historical presentations and walking tours scheduled throughout the rest of this week. Um, following tonight's program, we do request that you fill out an evaluation form, which is located over here at the refreshment table. Your comments help guide our programming at the library. Tonight, I'm pleased to, rec to welcome Dr. Robert Goller, who will be presenting on the Crow Creek Tribal Schools. He is a former teacher on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota and a current professor, professor of history at St. Cloud State University. He researches and writes about U.S. and American Indian history with a focus on the Northern Plains. His research has been published in Western Historical Quarterly and Indigenous Nation Studies Journal, among many other publications. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Goller. Thank you. How's everyone doing tonight? Yeah. Trying to get in moderation. How's our, how's our volume back there, okay? I feel like I'm echoing a little bit, okay. Well, welcome. Um, as April said, I come to you from St. Cloud State University. Um, we are uh, down the road, you have Mankato State, one of the state universities in, around here. And I teach history, as she said. And what I thought I would do for the presentation this time is maybe take you in a different direction. I'm not sure about uh, every year who you have coming to talk about different things. But um, as we recognize the, um, 100 and uh, more than 150 years um, 
uh, into uh, the U.S.-Dakota War, um, there's been a lot of focus on that time, and particularly on several weeks in history around here, and particularly for uh, work in Native American and U.S. history that Indian-white relations kind of uh, focus. Uh, and that's been a, been a big focus. Certainly this town is prominent in the history of the U.S.-Dakota War. Um, I'd like to move us into different elements that, re, that pertain to Dakota history and Native American history. Um, for me, a lot of this comes out of my own background. Um, I taught on the Pine Ridge Reservation for a couple of years. I taught on the Navajo Reservation for a couple of years. I got my PhD at Western Michigan University. I'll talk about a couple of those things as we go along. Um, but what I think is important is to look at events and then look at where they come and where they came from. Um, oftentimes, people look at an event as in and of itself. Um, historians often try to put it in context. What's the backdrop before? Where does it go afterward? So I'm going to mainly be moving us forward and bringing things into the 20th century. Uh, but as it pertains to New Ulm and the U.S.-Dakota War, to me it seems like that topic hits one theme of American history, which is conflict, right? And for many people, history is about conflict. We go from war to war, battle to battle. Um, for most of us, we don't get up in the morning and say, I think I'll have a battle today. Uh, most of history is not about battles and wars, although military history is important. Um, so I'm kind of stepping out of that world and looking more at a broader dimension. Um, in history, and you know, national and state history standards talk about how people get along in terms of stories of conflict and cooperation. I'm moving toward the cooperation side here. Um, and the point is not to say conflicts don't happen. We're not here to sort of whitewash the stories that don't happen that we don't like, but to look at this event in a broader spectrum of many other things that happen. So what you see up here are some images of a school that I'm looking at. And the school is, uh, you know, over time, kind of shifting from the 1870s, 80s, 90s to the 1950s to a new school today. And um, what I'm trying to look at is how that evolved and how groups work things together as opposed to how groups fought, right? Um, and the, that concept to me is an important part for ourselves today. Um, it's an important example as we think about how groups get along. Uh, I think too often history is filled with stories about how groups who are different fought. And that's true, groups who are different do fight, but groups who are different also find ways to work together. And that's part of what uh, I wanna be looking at here. Again, not taking away conflicts happen, um, but looking at some different dimensions that are there. So that's kind of the focus of what I'm looking at in terms of rethinking U.S.-Dakota relations. You might talk it, think about it just more broadly, rethinking how human beings get along. And you know, conflicts happen, so does cooperation. Um, my background, as I said, is at St. Cloud State University. Uh, the bottom picture there is um, of uh, the Pine Ridge Reservation, where I first started getting into the topic of looking at Northern Plains history. Having taught at a school called Red Cloud Indian School, a Catholic school uh, that had many, uh, well, 99% uh, Lakota students at the school, um, that kind of transformed how I looked at a lot of things. And for most of us, new experiences, you could just dash them away and say, I want to keep thinking the way I do. I hope that's not the way you'll leave here, like, I thought this, that guy's not going to change my mind. As much as new ideas can bring up new things. For me, growing up in a, in a suburb in the East Coast, the idea of Native American history was not good or bad. It just didn't exist. It didn't really matter to me at all. But as I started to move to places, I started to realize, wow, there's a lot, a lot of new dimensions to things. So the background for me in terms of that helped me to rethink of which parts of the story do we tell? If you think about people in terms of, if, you, if a metaphor could be a filmmaker, we got filmmakers here, um, if we think about it that way, who's the lead, right? Who gets the lead, who's the subordinate role, who's the minor role, who's standing up, who gets a lot of the car chase scenes, and who gets a lot of the quiet dialogue scenes. History is filled with a variety of things. I'm taking my angle here. I'm not telling you the whole story of everything. I'm telling you what I can find and what I see there's uh, varied uh, evidence for. So how do we do this? How do I go about looking at the research of a place? Um, I begin with, well, what did people write about it before? 
All right, um, you can think about that broadly in terms of US history. Do you like patriotic stories where everything gets better and better and better and better and better? Do you like decline stories of things were bad and then they got worse and worse and worse? Um, it, there's a variety of ways people have taught about Native American history, how Indian and non-Indians get along. Some of the stories are about how violent and vicious Native people were. Some of the stories about how um, unscrupulous um, white American federal missionaries were in their dialogue. What I'm trying to look at is how can we pull those things together um, is part of what I see. So I, I read some of the background material, then I started looking, looking for sources. And I'll be showing you that process of how I did the history through this beyond just I know what happened because it's in my head and you better listen to me. But this is how I know what I know. And there are clearly, no doubt, thousands of other sources that can come out there. You can all do your homework, take the next five years of your life after, and prove me wrong. But I'm, I'm showing you what I found, and this is how the story makes some sense to me. History, like a lot of things, is really a story. Um, to me, the difference, as I tell my students, is history is a story based on evidence. I think this, great idea. You got any proof? No, but I think it's right. If you, don't, if you don't have proof, it doesn't matter to me. I've got some of the background for what I'm doing. Um, we can all tell stories that we want to think. This is built off of that. So what I tried to do then is gather varied sources. And from those different sources, your perspective, your document, your memoir, your this, this government document, I tried to pull together to create a story that made sense to me. Created a narrative, and then I pitched it out to people. Um, people read different things I wrote. People heard presentations like you all. And from that, you get feedback. OK, I should think about that. Oh, have you ever looked at this? And the story evolves. History is an organic process. Like all stories, it evolves over time. And that's what I'm going to be looking at here. So for me, I did a whole variety of things. I went to Catholic archives in southern, um, southern Indiana. There's a place called St. Meinrad Abbey, where uh, Benedictines live. That's where a lot of the first priests who went out to South Dakota were. Um, I went to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. I went to the South Dakota uh, Historical Society. And in those places, I found things like transcribed statements by one of the Dakota leaders named Drifting Goose. Not written by him, but apparently translated from his word. Now you might say, wait a second, is that all right? I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, I do know that it's stated as written uh, his words, and I know it's there. Um, is it the final word? Could there be other things? Possibly, but I'm going to build it off of somebody wrote that. You might say, well, it might not be true. Everything might not be true. I don't know. But many things, if we congregate them together, we can build a story that way. I interviewed people. One of the former um, chairs, uh, tribal chairs at the Lower Brewer Reservation, Mike Jandrew, was a student at the school. And I heard from him. What did he think? Um, I went to the South Dakota Oral History Center, found transcriptions of interviews from other people. And through that, I gathered material to kind of tell the story of a place, um, of a place that in some ways seems quite remote, and it is. In other ways, it's part of a nexus of a lot of these bigger picture stories. Many of you know, after the US-Dakota War, many Dakota people were exiled to South Dakota. They go to the Cork Creek Reservation. Many of those folks ultimately leave and go south to northeastern Nebraska, where the Santee Reservation is, but some stay. And some stay with a collection of other native people from the Missouri River and form what's the Crow Creek Reservation. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But um, that's the sources, uh, the types of sources that I've used to try to tell this story as I go along. Um, the story of the Dakota people, the Yangtonais, the Hunkpatis, which are different divisions of this large group called the Ocheti Shakoin, the Seven Council Fires. It includes Dakota people who are connected to this region of Minnesota on up to Lakota people who end up more toward the Missouri River and beyond. It's a broad collection um, of groups that span kind of this whole northern plains over time. And um, the groups we're looking at, uh, and what I'm thinking about, is this region here, which of course includes this area and the Crow Creek Reservation there. It's not a stability story of people stayed in one spot and they lived there forever. They moved. They migrated. In their mind, it would make no sense to stay in one place. Why would you live in one place? 
you get good food here this time of year, you get good food there that time of year, you get medicines here this time of year, it would not make any sense to stay in one spot. So the idea of migration was part of what their lifestyle was. That, of course, um, is still going on well into the 1840s, 50s, 60s, 70s, into our time period, pre and post the U.S.-Dakota War. Uh, but we get a sense of people who have, over time, learned to adapt to any number of ecological and cultural settings. So we see that as part of the story, and this is kind of the backdrop for um, this group of people, and it's part of a backdrop for the story I'm going to tell about the, the formation of a school. Um, in most stories, or in many stories, we're very much focused upon the particular leaders of a group, right? Um, goodness knows how many presidential histories there are, right? Because it's about the person in charge. Well, um, I tried to broaden that story out so the story of a school is not just about the principal or the superintendent, but the people who are there. Um, there is, a, I think, a more common portrayal often of native people who are living in a place and thank goodness civilization and Christianity came to them because they had no ideas what to do beforehand. Um, this is more of a story of there are people living, as I said here, a viable lifestyle for generations. They didn't need anyone to tell them what to do. They had a system in place, and then new people show up. All right? So when new people show up, you can do a lot of different things. Right? You can stay away from them. You could say, everything I've done my whole life is awful. I'm going to be exactly like you tomorrow. Or you could do something in between. Clearly, what I'm looking at is that in-between part. You've got a famous Jesuit priest named Father Pierre de Smet who comes and makes lots of trips, four and five trips, up the Missouri River and befriends many of the native people along the way. Now, what does befriend mean? It means any number of different things. According to his journals, it means some people were great friends with him. They treated him well, any number of things. There are statements by native leaders who claim that he is their good friend, and he keeps a connection with them even when he leaves. Um, but there's some connection there, right? When we're talking about interpersonal relations, it's hard to know exactly what's that relationship like. I can hear from you, and I can hear from you, but... You, people think differently about what their relationship is, but we do know there's some kind of relationships happening. When de Smet moves on, uh, Bishop Martin Marty comes in. And Bishop Martin Marty, not a Jesuit, but a Benedictine, comes in, but similarly believes, as a person um, of faith, that his point is to work with people out on the plains. Now, clearly, there's a long and strong focus on let's convert people, but what conversion means on both sides of a divide is a little bit unclear as well. Now, often the stories about schools and American history on the plains begins and ends with these people. Why? Because they write. They can often write in English. Some of them write in German. Um, but they write and they leave records. And that's the story, right? Uh, what I try to do is pull in more of well, stories are about different people, not just people on one side of the story, but other sides. So what we try to look at are, what does the Yankton leader Two Bears think? What does the Hung Pati leader Drifting Goose from the Crow Creek Reservation, what does he think if we're talking about that dynamic between people? So that's kind of the backdrop of how the story of the formation of a school happens, right? People who have different interests in different times can find common cause to operate together. <coughs> the 1880s at Crow Creek are a complicated time, right? We're a couple of years after, um, after the Battle of Little Bighorn. Uh, we're in a time period where there's a lot of, quote, opening up of land, which some people would say is theft, but opening up sounds nicer. Um, there's land being opened up and people moving in, and the people who were sent there and the people who are there, Dakota people, are wondering, what, what's happening here? I thought we were going to be here, and I thought you said this is our place, and people start moving in. So many of them uh, you know, start to figure out, well, how am I going to work with this new system that's in here, right? You could say, I don't like your rules, uh, but they're the rules. And in some ways, what we see happening on the Plains and in the West generally is the movement in of American legal systems, of this is the rules, these are the way they operate. So they start to learn what those things are. Many of them, therefore, very quickly realize, OK, if I am going to get a, a piece of land, um, I'm going to have to get my name registered. And I mean, these are the names of the people. These are their marks. These are their ranks. But they're also recognized as 
um, recipients or, or as um, recognized as claiming certain pieces of land around the reservation by the 1880s. There's interesting stories and images by um, the workers who are at the agency who um, actually uh, draw, um, draw pictures of and depict the main leaders of the region. And there's a photograph of the place as well to get a sense of what is this place like before the school is formed, right? Um, in Native American history, this post-Civil War time is uh, a major way of looking at uh, what's happening with Native people is this is the time period after the wars happen that the whole shift is moved to assimilation. And in a way, what we see, perhaps simplistically, is creation of a school is a story of assimilation, right? And that is part of the story, but if you only tell it from the assimilator's point of view, that's the only story. Um, I'm trying to look at the, the multiple strands that are involved here. So that's Crow Creek in the 1880s. Here's one of the Crow Creek leaders named White Ghost. And what's fascinating is the amount of resources that there are in the National Archives and other places documented statements by Native leaders during this time period. Them saying things like, you told us it would be in this land forever. Hereafter, no white man or the government will disturb the portion of land again. We're in the 1880s, and they're saying, they're trying to take the land again. This is 1883, again in 1884. But you see, it's not so much they didn't know. They see what's happening. And you also see the tactical politicians of native leaders, like White Ghost, who say, um, I did not want to sign it, but still, the missionary led me by the hand to sign it. Mr. Burt is an Episcopal uh, missionary. And he apparently, who was in charge there, said, you should sign this. This is in your best interest. Now, he sees after a while that doesn't work out. And this actually fits into the story, because as one, politic, uh, as one religious denomination comes in, <clears throat> and allies itself with the federal power structures, native leaders are saying, that's not the guy to work with. I've got to find somebody else to work with if we're going to retain any of what we have, right? So thinking that through, um, there are countless documents that give you a little bit of insight into what are the native leaders at the time thinking? Why are they going to work with non-Indian people? And one of the problems with why they're going to work with non-Indian people is they're savvy enough to realize the world is not Indian and non-Indian, there's different non-Indian people. There's different missionaries. They both say they promote Catholic, uh, they both say they promote Christianity, but they've got different angles. And they're starting to distinguish between people within a broad category. Something that we could all use today, right? Instead of labeling people by a perceived race and all people like this do this and all people like that do that, they're starting to look between and say, this guy, Mr. Burt, might have pushed us in the wrong direction. I might want to look somewhere else for an ally. And that's the direction where we go. By the time we get into the 1880s, many of these tribal leaders are therefore looking out and saying, maybe it's the Catholics. Let's go with the Catholics. These guys show up. They often don't come with a family. So they probably don't want our land. Um, we've known this guy Desmet for a number of generations. We've known this guy Marty. We're going to have to ally with somebody. A lie does not mean I will give everything up and be just like him. A lie means I'm going to make an alliance. And I'm going to figure out a way to kind of work with somebody. Um, one of the articles I wrote, I called it Making Common Cause. We've got a common thing, right? The, the priests want to create schools to teach Christianity and Catholicism. The native people realize we've been in a lot of treaty sessions. We don't know the language or the politics. We want to learn that. Um, so if you want to call it a Catholic school, I'm calling it a tribal school, we're still going to walk into the same building. I'm going to learn a little bit from you, maybe you learn a little bit from me as part of the process we see in here. So over the course of the 1880s, tribal leaders are actually reaching out and saying, can you come and can you set up a school? We've got stuff to learn. These are people who are not defeated. Right? There's some sense, especially if you read US history books, that you know, after the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, they lost, they're giving up. No, these are people who are looking ahead saying, wait a second, we've been forced out of Minnesota. Now we're told we can stay in South Dakota, and they're moving up against us. What should we do? Quit is a possibility, but that's not their choice. Their choice is, let's look ahead and figure out how can we create a world where we can fit into that and still maintain who we are. And that's, that's part of what we see. So through the 1880s, they reach out to different people. Some of the native people themselves, Drifting Goose, Bull Ghost, Crow Man, they're actually reaching out and talking to people, saying, we want you to help us set up a school. Because we want to have a place where we can learn the system so we can fit in as best we can. 
while retaining who we are. Um, interestingly, um, over the course of the time, they create a petition, this is an image of it, uh, with their names saying, we like the black robes to come in. We'd like a Catholic priest to come in and start a school in this location, right? Um, now, on some levels, we often hear the story of the missionaries came and they founded it, almost as if it's imposed on them. Some people then critique the focus of telling uh, Native people what to do. This is more looking at, no, they understand what's going on. They understand that they can work with them, and they're actually reaching out themselves. So instead of a story of victims who wait for things to happen, this is a story of people who stand up and start to say, we want to participate. And again, participate does not mean we're giving everything up. We want to participate in this scenario. And by the time we get into the 1880s, one of the first priests shows up. He meets some of the local people. George Tuttle and Sarah LaCroix are both um, of Dakota ancestry, and they help them select and locate the first school. Uh, not the first school there, but the, the first school in the northern part of the reservation. But intercultural relations are complicated, right? Again, they're not all about war and love. There is somewhere in between, right? We meet people who are different, and sometimes we want to reach out and befriend them, sometimes saying, hold off a second. And that's true at Crow Creek. You read some of the accounts of the first meetings. Father Pius Bame, in the good tradition of the Catholic Church and in the good tradition of the federal officials, they always send somebody out who knows nothing about where they're showing up, right? He's never met an Indian person before, so he's going to be in charge. Pretty common, actually, but he shows up, doesn't know what's going on, but he does finally meet two people. Bull Ghost is one of the guys who said, we want a Catholic priest. And Bull Ghost says to him, according to Bame at least, if we're going to do anything, we ought to have Roman Catholics help us because we know they are honest people. They might say, doesn't he know they might? Well, in his experience, that's what it is, right? We can't base this on what we know happened in 1930, but in his experience, he's met Catholics who have honestly tried to help and to spent, in many cases served as an ally with them early on. Standy Elk on the other side shows that, that everyone's not in lockstep, right? They're not all agreeing with one guy. He says, God made the earth and all this land was made for the Indians. The white man is coming here to root up the ground. If you come for our land, we will kick you out. Two people showing up at the same time, both looking at things differently, right? We know in our world today, our politicians, our community leaders, any group you're in, people are gonna look at it differently. But it shows kind of the texture of the community is paying attention. They're keeping their eye out to see what is gonna go on here. So this collaboration is complicated, but it's still a collaboration that grows over time. So why do people then send their kids to these uh, Catholic schools? And of course, I'm telling you the story of a Catholic school. I'm not pretending to tell you the story of all Catholic schools. I'm not to pretending to tell you the story of all boarding schools. I'm telling you about this and what I found. Um, any number of reasons. By the time you hit the 1880s, 1890s, kids are pretty much forced. You've got to attend school. So the issue is, well, where should I go? Should I be forced to get on a train and travel four days to go to Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania? I don't know if that's a good idea. Should I? What are my options, right? So thinking these things through. They've heard of deaths in Eastern schools. There are any number of people who are targeted to go to these Eastern schools in Pennsylvania early on. And if you've ever heard of the Carlisle Indian School, there's a big cemetery out back. And in some ways, it's almost not surprising, not that we're supportive of it, but people who are traveling thousands of miles, little kids, without their parents being ripped up and suddenly they're in a new place and they're supposed to thrive, not everyone will, right? So, I mean, that backdrop is going to resonate in a community's mind, and the different Native people of Crow Creek are going to say, if i got to send my kid to school, why don't I send them close so I can check up on them regularly, right? I mean, that sense. And all of us who are parents <clears throat> can probably appreciate that idea, and it almost makes you wonder, how did those other parents allow that? Different story. Um, they hear about what's happening at the agency. They hear about how the missionary in the past, the Protestant missionary, no offense, we're not making broad generalizations about Catholics are good and Protestants are bad, whatever your background is. But they remember that, that that missionary there, he's the one who helped them lose their land. So maybe we should ally with this different Catholic missionary. Um, they've had prior experiences before. And for many people on the northern part of the reservation, that's where the school is going to be. I can get there quickly if I need to. And you know, thinking about yourself or parents, when you first send your kid off to school, you want to have that access so you can see that kind of story. 
History has often told us a story about exotic people who are different. In some ways, parents are parents, right? Parents care about their kids. And on what level we see that might vary, but there's that backdrop. So in some ways, I, I feel like it's important to step back and say, well, why did people go to a school of a foreign group of people showing up? They have to, they have to pick choices. This seems to fit on a number of different levels. Um, several, as we said, had already been to these schools out east. And they came back telling stories that probably said, you better stay close. Or maybe some of them even did thrive, but they've heard about others not. And, th and that's part of the story that we see here too. Um, school opens quite humbly. And in many cases, like any uh, institutions in early times, they are pretty small. Um, by 1887, when it starts, there's just 30 students. Um, one of the sisters there says, uh, we have 24 beds. Uh, I have 10, 10 beds, two small uh, girls sleep together. I mean, it's a small place that's really kind of uh, connected in a way that allow, the, the forces them to, I think it should have said 24 uh, children, but um, they ultimately have to kind of uh, bunk up together. The building is small, it's modest, um, and in a way, you might think of any venture you've been involved with in the first year or so, let's see if this thing's going to work, right? Um, early on, uh, one morning, Father Pius, who, who's the guy we showed in a picture a few minutes ago, he looks up and sees a whole bunch of kids just running away, right? Uh, like many institutions early on, it may not survive. Uh, we now know it does, but like many things, it's, it's uh, humble in its origins to begin with. Um, there's a lot of challenges when you create a collaborative setting with people from different backgrounds, but people find ways to work it out. Some interesting parts to me were that um, part of the whole mission that the federal government wanted to have schools for native people is they want to teach them English. So what do they do? They bring in priests and sisters who speak German, and they don't even have that much English. But this is the school they should go to, um, and sometimes even the, the school administrators and the, uh, the school... Um, Agents come in and say, your teachers speak in German. I mean, so it's an interesting kind of uh, dynamic, and it's complicated. I heard a, a priest many years ago say that he heard some, this is in Pine Ridge, he heard that there were a number of uh, Lakota people who spoke English with a German accent, because that's how they learned how to speak English. So I mean, it's interesting kind of hybrid of who's involved. There are times clearly where the schools filled with disease, right? A whole bunch of people in one spot. Um, it's an era with, with different medications, less medication. I mean, there's some real challenges that's really going to call into question to parents, should I send my kids anywhere, right? I mean, but that's part of the backdrop. But we do also have examples of people getting along. Uh, people, uh, the, the children doing well with some of the uh, sisters. And uh, one of the sisters in particular is known as very beloved by the girls. But I sometimes just, regardless of those statements I've pulled out, I just look here and I start to wonder, wow, what are those folks thinking, right? We're in like 1892 in a picture like that. They grew up uh, speaking Dakota. They grew up in a family that's completely different. Now they're sitting there wearing some kind of um, uniform and told to take a picture. What's going on in those heads, right? I mean, complicated whole dynamics when we think about those kind of things. Um, but ultimately, we have a school that starts as sort of this distant place on barren land to becoming a, a, a very different school than it is today. From a school that begins to promote assimilation, today they teach uh, Dakota and Lakota language in the same campus area. So we're seeing a, a change is going to evolve over time. The change does not come because suddenly somebody from afar said it needs to change as much as internally families have always had some influence and students have always had some influence. So by the time we hit the 60s and 70s, their influence is going to shift to change the dynamics. And of course, our national culture changes as a backdrop too. Um, so, I mean, if, if it's of any value, uh, maybe those of you who are close can see this more, but I mean, this is just lists of students that I found attending school at different times. You see families with three and four kids sending them. They're coming from uh, Lower Brule, Crow Creek, different reservation communities in that central South Dakota area. And some of that information could come right out of the census. So how do you pull together who's there? Well, you look at the census. The census says, Who's, uh, which kids are going to which schools, you can start to lay out, oh, I see, that family went and this family didn't. You corroborate that with allotment records and see where they lived and you see a lot of the families who lived in the northern part went there, right? 
Are they typically more Catholic or predisposed to Catholicism? Probably not, but they live closer, right? So, I mean, we've got different mindsets. Some might have been, uh, over time, therefore, connected to Catholicism, but a variety of different reasons and, and, and elements here. Um, the other thing I note as I look at these things are, you know, the eight-year-olds that are heading off, um, you know, six-year-olds that are heading off to school. Now, some of the little ones head off to school when they do have an older sibling there, but thinking about what that means to them in that time period. Um, as I said, um, often stories of schools, institutions are told from the founder's perspective. We did this, we sent the teachers in, we got the money. Well, I think the other side of that is all schools and institutions are somewhat incumbent upon working with their constituencies. And what you see as you dig beyond the stories of top-down history, leadership history, is what are the grassroots people doing? And if you look through accounts further, you start to see, ah, the students are writing letters to somebody named Catherine Drexel. Maybe some of you have heard of her or not. She's a famous, uh, she became a saint in 2000, I think, right? Um, and she's a, a, a major philanthropist, particularly um, for African American and Indian communities. She basically keeps this place going for the 1890s and 1900s early on because she puts her money into it. And we see the kids are writing letters to her. They might say, oh, that's cute. Well, it's cute, but also if you're writing checks to people, you're going to stop writing if you don't hear from them. You get a nice letter from a student who says something, you can see how the input of students helps to pay for this school because their influence gives the benefactor the disposition to say, I'm going to keep doing this. And that's part of the story. Um, we have any number of accounts from priests themselves who say um, in 1888, 30 or 40 Indian families have stuck up their teepees about 300 yards from the house. They're engaged in hauling the building material for the new house. They're actually physically building this school. So as you start thinking about, well, is it a Catholic school or Indian school? I mean, depends on who you ask. If they're actually rolling up their sleeves and building structures, they see it as their school. And there's going to be some tension over that. And I by no means mean to suggest that actually the native people ran the whole thing all the time. Clearly they don't, but they've got influence over that time. Again, an example of when two groups are together, they can find a way with perhaps unequal power relations to create something together. And I think that in this day and age is an important lesson for us to always know. One of the things that I think history teaches us, if you delve back, you can find positive examples of that. And I think that's one there. Um, when tragedy hits, and um, some of the kids from the Cheyenne River Reservation um, get sick, word spreads. Word spreads back to their family, and the parents come and say, I'm taking you home. Um, so the idea that, well, Native parents probably didn't care. They just sent their kids off and let them be there for a year. Oh, they're caring, and they're paying attention, and they're sometimes pulling their kids out when they feel the need to. So that whole connector piece in here. Again, top-down stories tell... I created the curriculum, I built a building, I then uh, you know, instructed these people, I then uh, baptized them, I did this. That may have all happened, but there are a lot of other pieces happening, right? Again, who's the, who's the main actor in your story? Um, <clears throat> prairie fires are tragic things that happen often out there, particularly in that day and age, and guess who's helping to fight the fire? Not the two priests who are on, although they would too, but you need a lot more people than that. And it's interesting how the balance of sort of pragmatism and spirituality happens, because at the same time, many people are out fighting the fires. Often the sisters are in the chapel praying, and they believe they're doing the same thing, right? They're all fighting it back, and they're bringing the kids into that process. But again, coming together um, to preserve a place in, in common opposition. Sometimes uh, Native students themselves are burned considerably. And at some points, even priests who are coming to this world pretty much thinking they know the right answer, they have the sole truth, they have the catechism, and we should be that and, and we're in charge, even start to recognize, you know what? These kids are helping to save this place, right? Uh, the boys and girls all deserve, uh, deserve all the credit for their services. The poor children had been out nearly all night in fighting the fire. The children acted splendidly and it's difficult to say what might have happened without their help. Um, so even the priests are starting to recognize that, and this is coming from people who are probably less likely to think about the other side of things, and even he's starting to recognize, wow, we are in a, in a combined story that way. 
Um, ultimately, schools like uh, Stefan are going to cultivate a lot of land, produce a lot of crops to help support themselves. And in many cases, they're doing it far cheaper than the government's doing it. And that's their, that's their advocacy for getting support. Now, right around this time is when the feds are going to say, we're pulling money out. And they're going to have to survive on their own. But um, they're involved with a lot of different things. Um, and they're trying to be as much as possible self-sustaining. This is an image that maybe you can see a little bit back from the back. And you probably can't read the words too well. Um, but um, I'll just highlight for you. Um, I, I just like the image of a bunch of people, staff and students, with instruments. They head off in 1892 to give a concert and a play. And if you read all these different things, you see students from different reservations, non-Indian students, priest sisters, all are kind of coming together to creatively make something. And let's face it, what does draw people together more than a common task, right? And things like that help that to develop. And you know, this is one example of others. And uh, whether you can read that or not, I mean, you can perhaps trust me, or you can read the, the document later. Um, but it's quite a range of people who were involved in a single act. And that's part of the story. Now, I don't mean to say that there weren't problems there. And there are problems in all institutions of people and getting along and not getting along. There's stories of fighting that happens. There's stories of buildings burned. And uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And sometimes they're suspecting, and often probably right, rightfully so, that the kids start the fires. There's, there's problems that get in there. And uh, not that I'm, I mean, I'm mentioning them, but these other stories need to be part of that as well, how they are able to come together as time goes on. Um, they have a meal plan that really looks like meat and potatoes on so many different levels. Um, they have this food that's listed up there. Maybe some of you can help me with. Um, they, they list in there something called nonsense. And I swear I read about it in the last couple of months, what nonsense might be. Anybody with German background know what that might stand for? I thought it was some kind of combination of apples and potatoes, but I don't quite remember. But I mean, they're pulling together food that's very much meat, potatoes. There's not a whole lot of, you know, they're not doing too much of uh, rice pilaf. They're not doing a whole bunch of uh, vegetable uh, things. Uh, they're doing what they can draw out, out of their own land. And that's, that's what they're living off of, which um, on some levels, you know, seems, you know, admirable they can pull it together. On other levels, you think, wow, they're eating the same thing almost all the time. Um, in terms of their progress, they've got a regular organized schedule that's set up at least. Now, those, those of us who work in schools or have been to schools or other organizations know there's a schedule and then there's how it actually operates. I wasn't there and there's no videotape of how it actually operated. But we do see there is a schedule that they tried to create some order out of their day. And then you have random images that I find of um, somebody must have sent them these outfits and they have these Dakota girls dressed in a certain way to learn something about Japanese style and culture. Um, who knows, right? Uh, it makes you wonder how many other kind of random things happen through that time. But there's some sort of mixture of structure and people who happen to have materials that they share uh, by that time. Um, by the time you hit the late 1890s, things are looking pretty difficult. And I think this is maybe an example of how often the founding of organizations, the first couple of years are tough. We roll up our sleeves, we're going to do great. Here we're like 10, almost 15 years in, and almost you wonder whether or not this place is even going to survive. You've got a major fire that hits in 1895. This building's destroyed. You have many of the brothers who are here being called back by their monastery saying, we can't afford to send you out there. You've got fewer people. You've got that. And then the federal government says, we're not going to put money into that anymore. right? Those of you who know American history might recognize 1893. Yeah, that was one of those economic declines in American history. We only hear about the stock market crash. But in 1873, 1893, they're big economic declines. And guess what? They're going to pull money out of certain programs. that They put a lot in for a while, but they're going to pull it out. So they're going to go from $10,000 from federal support down to $3,000. How do they survive? You wonder if they will. Somehow they cobble it together from uh, Catherine Drexel, who I mentioned before. They create sort of this fundraising organization, something called uh, the Bureau of Catholic Indian Missions, that then puts out a publication 
monthly or semi-monthly um, called the Indian Sentinel to get the word out. And basically, this is where we are. We need money. And trying to draw it out from the broader public. And maybe some of you are on those mailing lists today. Those kind of things continue on in different permutations. Um, but ultimately, um, by the time you get around 1900, there's very little money coming in. And somehow, they have to figure out a way to survive. And that's when, once again, tribal members step in. Um, during the Teddy Roosevelt administration, they turned to the idea of, hmm, how else might we have access? Well, if tribal members want to, they can designate some of their treaty funds to support a school that they send their kids to. And uh, the federal government is, is clear there, though. We're not just going to send it. You've got to have tribal members say you want, uh, they want some of this money to come to support the school. And we get these petitions that come out uh, of them saying that they want to be educated, they want the fathers to be here, um, they want the sisters to be here. We, the parents and guardians of the children now attending Immaculate Conception School, most earnestly uh, pray that Honorable Commissioner from here on will use the funds for this mission school. So in tough time again, it's not going to survive unless parents step up and say, we want it. Right? We want to have some kind of school here. And you know, here's another example of uh, people signing their names on these different parts. Um, and then you see almost every couple of years, you know, that's, uh, what was my date here? 1904, then it's maybe 1909, 1913. They have to regularly come in and sign in to say, we want to support this. So it's an active uh, approach that goes on here. Whoops. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, and uh, so many people are standing up and saying, we'd like to support it. Some of the original founders, like Bull Ghost, Walking Crane, um, With Tail, I mean, a number of these people are part of the Seeking Land. They're some of the first people who are there. They or their descendants are now signing. You start to see there's a familial tradition. Again, it's debatable. Are they really Catholic? Do they care about the Catholic Church? Maybe they do. Some do. Some don't. Some very much so, actually. Some like the idea of having a school nearby, and that's where we want to do it. So the variety of things. But we're starting to get into a second generation of people who are coming. So you might also say, these are people who've experienced it. They're not basing it on a hope. They're basing it on, this worked for me on some level. right? Um, and then by the time you get into some of these issues, it's also the native support that helps, I don't know, embolden, enliven the priest to then say, I'm going to stick it out further. Um, after a big fire hits in 1916, um, the priest Pius Bame is shocked. He's like, these folks want me to open it tomorrow. The feds are saying, keep it closed for a while, build it when you can, whatever it takes. He's saying, no, they're showing up with blanket rolls and beds and saying, when are you going to open up again? Um, and that's shocking to him. I never thought the Indians care so much for their school. The question of rebuilding is no longer open. We, uh, we simply have to rebuild. The idea of standing up and by that influence, they are empowering the leaders to continue on and this back and forth relationship that's there. Um, ultimately, um, Drifting Goose, who's one of the founders I mentioned way back, uh, one of the founders who signed one of the first petitions by the time we get into 1916, um, we have Drifting Goose's son, George Turner, going on trips in you know, an early Ford out to try to get money in local parishes, sometimes traveling you know, way, uh, way far into, um, actually, that should say Indiana diocese, uh, to raise money to bring back for the school. So we see this engagement and connection to supporting the school. So again, as I said earlier on, you know, is it a Catholic school or a tribal school? It's some melding thereof. It might be officially listed by one, but the community might think it differently. And don't we all, in some institutions we're part of, see very different parts of it and participate for different reasons that's part of it. And they can bring in thousands of dollars as this time goes. As you move into the 1930s, uh, the school is struggling just like many in the Great Depression. And in many cases, however, um, they're starting to see, wow, this New Deal has programs that we could use. Just like communities throughout the country, they start to tap into that to support themselves. And you have um, one of the priests actually writing a play about their first 50 years. 
interestingly, um, somewhat romantic story about how we struggled and got together and how the Catholic spirit and the Catholic faith helped make us this great school. The, the, several of the students who are uh, descendants of the founders are participating in it. It's part of a reflective process of thinking about history. Um, may or may not be in agreement with everybody who participated in it, but we see, like many organizations and groups, after 50 years, they're going to try to commemorate, think about something in a way, and try to figure out who are they and where are they from. So while that's going on, many of the leaders are also tapping into different federal programs. And then like seems to often happen as I'm doing my research, boom, another natural disaster comes in. If it's not a fire, there's a tornado. A tornado comes in and whips through. Uh, there had been one probably only 10 or 15 years earlier as well. Um, and that starts to pump up more their publications. They actually create their own publications uh, called Wopida, Thanks Joy, to send out to people, to gather people in, to get some support. Yet at the same time, we're also getting into the 1930s, um, the time period we're moving in when um, students are starting to, uh, or at least there's more recognition of students doing research and learning about the world. Because these students go in school in the 1930s, some of them are getting up in World War II, and you actually see hints of them learning about National Geographic, them giving a talk about Mussolini, and um, them giving a talk about the building of the Boulder Dam. The Boulder Dam will ultimately be a sign of many dams that flood their land. Um, what's happening with Mussolini in Europe is going to bring many of them into participate in World War II, but you get hints of they're getting some training to prepare themselves to move on from there. And you can, I can also find examples of uh, Drifting Goose's uh, uh, great-grandson, Paul Harrison, um, out participating in the school as well. So we see an evolution of things as we go on. Moving into World War II era, um, you know, like many people, just before the war, you know, it's 1940, the war's going on in Europe, but kids at Stefan are playing basketball, and they're winning the state tournament, they're going to the national tournament. I mean, that's part of a big thing, right? And that's true for all of us in, in many time periods. Yet at the same time, by the time you hit 1941, many people are joining the military. Um, and some, like Edmund St. John, who, who's a student from there, is actually going to be part of a group called the Sioux Code Talkers. Some of you have heard of the Navajo Code Talkers. They're actually code talkers of different tribal languages. And so students from the school are going to be part of that. And I started to notice in the last uh, parts of um, my research how many overlaps increasingly connected into, this could be told about many schools, right? You know, the, the school in downtown New Ulm is probably having kids in the 1930s playing basketball, and I bet you some of them end up in World War II, right? Uh, we see these kind of stories, and the whole exotic, what's an Indian school about, can move you away from, what are students doing? The, this is a school in similarity, too. And I think sometimes with history and with history of groups of people who are non-white, uh, people who are look at, oh, it must be some exotic school. It is also a school. And um, so many of their traditions are maybe parallel there. There's also stories of other folks uh, doing heroic things in, in um, Germany as well. Uh, Grover St. John, uh, another member from Crow Creek, is part of that. Post-World War II era, I'm kind of going to try to pull it together here a little bit. Post-World War II era is an era of lots of growth, lots of building. And if you think about American history, that's a big part of it, right? There's some sense of, as a result of World War II, we start to believe we can control nature. Um, it comes back to bite us after a while, but they start building these, um, these dams across the Missouri River. Every time you build the dam, what happens? The water floods back. Many of the reservation communities are destroyed in terms of their best land. Not all of their land, but their bottom lands, where their medicines are, where their foods are. And a lot of those are being hurt pr tremendously by that. And it's ironic, of course, when so many Native people stood up and fought in World War II, that coming back, they're going to lose land at the same time. It's a repeated story. But at the same time that building's going on, you see some of the Catholic leaders saying, we want to commit to this area even more. And they actually moved their monastery to north uh, eastern South Dakota, a place called Blue Cloud Abbey, um, in 1950. They build a new school in the 1950s. And we start to resemble a, a more 
similar to public schools. By the 1930s, they had high school graduates. By the 1950s, they're building a school that resembles any number of schools that we might see in Minnesota and other places as well. So there's a certain sense of maybe normalizing that, that we can see in that process. There's still some differences because by the late 50s, we're starting to see the rise up of a new generation of priests and a new generation of kids. The priests are allowing and supporting and promoting your native heritage is fine. And Indian clubs are going to start to develop in the late 50s and start to grow over time into the 60s and 70s. I'm going to end uh, with a story of Raymond Rubidoux, uh, who probably people haven't heard of before. But he's one of these examples of what happens at a place like Stefan Mission. Um, He's a graduate of 1941. He goes on and uh, goes to a place called Haskell Indian uh, Institute in Kansas for a while, then joins the war. Um, after it breaks out, he's a navigator, goes to Europe for three years and comes back. And with the help of the GI Bill, he ends up going to uh, college, going to grad school, he, uh, to law school. He works for a congressman from South Dakota. Um, and ultimately graduates. He's one of the first uh, American Indian lawyers in South Dakota. And some of these people must be applauding, right? The priest must be thinking, look at what we did. We got a guy to be a lawyer, and he's prominent there. And then we start to see what cases he's involved with. He's involved with cases like, you guys got to stop building this dam right here because you're flooding our land. And he's starting to use his education to petition for, that dam needs to be moved so not as much land is destroyed. And ultimately, what, what really caught me last summer when I, uh, when I was researching, he becomes one of the lawyers for the American Indian Movement um, in South Dakota. He's moving to Rapid City and becomes part of kind of this, uh, you know, native activism time in support of that. Um, now, how do you want to describe people? Describing people in one category is problematic. He's a story of the successful assimilation that happens. He's also the story of native culture and persistence that continues on despite that, right? The idea of groups coming together. One group doesn't have to take over the other group as much as groups can learn from each other. A famous Lakota leader named Luther Standing Bear went to a boarding school many years ago in the 1880s, and he said, you know what? Boarding schools, and he fully recognizes many people today think they're awful, right? Boarding schools could have been good. You got two groups of people who could learn from each other, but the Americans decided, we'll do the teaching, you do the listening. But what are the possibilities if we learn from each other? In a way, Rubidoux is an example of, I'm learning your lessons, I'm figuring things out, and I'm going to support my people in the process. So for me, ultimately, what's the significance of this school? It's a story of collaboration. It's also a story of Native people who have ingenuity and influence and assert to develop for themselves the type of community they want. Now, I don't want to overstate everything's perfect and everyone's grand. This poverty at Crow Creek today, right? Uh, there are also people getting college degrees, right? Uh, and that's probably true in New Ulm as well, I'm guessing, right? Um, there's that kind of di dialectic that's going on, and that's happening in this time period. So as we commemorate violent acts, military history, and those things, there's also other stories that came out of that that go on. This just happens to be one. Is this a story of people like Pius Bame, the great Catholic founder of a school? Sure, partly. It's also the story of Drifting Goose, who had the foresight to say, let's get a school here. He's actually buried right alongside Pius Bame in the cemetery in the back. Let's get a school here, and let's see what we can do about moving people forward. And that's part of uh, what we have from here. Um, these are a couple of things that I've written that connect into there. I can leave that up if anyone has interest in there. But uh, that's, that's, what I kinda, that's the way I kind of envision a different way of looking at commemorating Indian white relations and Native American history of what happened beyond there, right? Ending the story with tragedy, ending the story with loss, death, violence, that's part of a story, but there are other stories that come out of that, and I think that's important as well. I'd be glad to take a couple questions if people want to do that, um, or we can kind of talk afterward. Do you guys have a format for the way you do this here, or any way it works? OK. Questions people might have? Yeah. I noticed one of your slides mentioned the, the closing of the federal school at Fort Thompson. Mm -hmm. What was the federal government? Federal government had a school there as well, yeah. Why did it close? Uh, on and off. Uh, one of them, if it's the, I uh, forget which slide, but one of them, it was right on the banks of the river. So when they flooded it, they just had to move it. Um, there are other times when they had a boarding school 
And um, they just weren't able to, I think like during World War I, they couldn't get enough staff to work it. And they had to close it because people are off to war and things like that. But I think the one you're referring to is, you know, like many people, let's build something right on the river. It's a nice spot. They flooded it and got rid of a lot of those main institutions, which is tough for a small community to lose a thing like that. But, but there was that there. So now really the only um, school on the reservation is uh, Stefan. And I should add one more piece to that. It was in the 1970s. Um, that actually the school then does a transfer over. The Benedictine leaders decide the tribe should run it themselves, and they transition through the 70s from, uh, from Benedictine rule to Crow Creek rule. So it's kind of a, more of a community school. It's not a Catholic school at all. They've gotten rid of almost all the vestiges of the Catholicism that's there, uh, but there is still a small chapel on campus grounds that some people participate in too. So good question. Other questions, ideas? Sir? Was Ro Robidoux ever successful in getting a dam moved? Uh, to the extent, I mean, there are were, there were a couple examples of, you know, them rearranging where it moved. Sometime it was, wasn't so much about stopping it as much as getting appropriate compensation for the land loss. There's a variety of different things, and it's not just him. What's interesting, too, is many of the people who are pushing back are graduates of Stefan School who then become tribal leaders, who they're on the panels then during that time period. So in a way, their education is helping prepare them to push back on a different level than signing a new treaty, but pushing back against these kind of things. So more tinkering than stopping, but good. Sir. Uh, I've heard it say many times, can uh, these schools, can they uh, get some funding from the gambling casinos? The, the, they can, and uh, Crow Creek is, like many communities, it's not quite right next to downtown Minneapolis or somewhere like that that you have access to a lot of people. So they have a casino. I think it's open and closed. I think it's open again now, but the access to enough people to bring enough funds in to use it is the issue. So I think they have one. Um, I'm not sure if money from that is connected specifically to the school or what parts, but that is a, a venue people have tried. And in the 60s and 70s, there's a lot of dollars coming in to build new businesses and stuff like that. Some of them work, many of them didn't. Because of infrastructure, location, land, there's a lot of different pieces to that. So. Uh, well, first, first of all, my teaching was not there, but a different school, right? But my experience was super interesting. Um, I often feel, and many people who are teachers might think the same thing, I think I learned sometimes more than I taught, uh, but it was a great example of getting to know people and meeting people on different levels and seeing that, you know, talking to these kids about basketball is what they're interested in. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of that commonality theme. Uh, the idea that, um, well, Native people have all assimilated. I mean, I have kids coming into school late because they went hunting in the morning. Or they have to go off on the powwow circuit at certain times. So seeing that that's part of what their life is is going on. And also the collaboration. I mean, one of the funny stories I heard uh, there was how for the longest time, um, you know, the missionaries are coming in, get rid of your religion, get rid of your language. But when you're there, you hear on the interpersonal level, there were some priests who would tell some of the kids, teach me a word, I'll give you a piece of candy. They want to learn it. Though officially the, 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 the church may say no, they're having that combination. And as we move into the 1970s, a lot of priests, I mean, I went to a number of ceremonies and there were priests there who were participating in the native ceremonies that a generation before they were supposed to eliminate, right? So, I mean, you saw that kind of complicated nature between them. Like all schools, I had great students and students who didn't care as much. That was common. Some of them went off, and, and Red Cloud School itself actually has a lot of kids who become Gates scholars, scholars going on to graduate school. Um, one of my students, I know when I went back there, she now works in the development office. They, you know, people have gone on to, in different directions. But Pine Ridge also has quite a poverty rate, so I know all of them didn't participate. But my experience was, was quite, quite good for me, and it led me to want to learn more. Partly why I'm here today is because in that experience, I thought, there's more i got to learn about this. And that's what propelled me into graduate school. So thanks. Other questions, comments people have? So, you mentioned that the um, children in the schools were 
Christianized were their parents? Because it sounded like the parents sent them there. Some were very much so. Some were strong advocates, and some of them were part of, you know, the, uh, they had these things annually. Bishop Marty decided in the 1890s, Native people like to every summer go off and travel because they're used to going to the Sundance, their traditions of hunting and visiting relatives. Let's create a Catholic Congress. So when they're gathering together around the 4th of July weekend, they're going to do it anyway. Let's have a Catholic theme to that. So many of these folks were actually leaders in the Catholic Church. A Lakota or Dakota Catholic Church is maybe not necessarily the same thing as another Catholic Church, and if you look at how different religious mindsets are, but they might have a lot of the similar trappings and connections. So, yeah, there are a number of people who strongly want to send their kids to a Catholic school, but what they think of as Catholic might be very different than the priest who's teaching them Catholicism, but there's that, that blending. Uh, you know, anthropologists use the term religious syncretism, blending of traditions together. So they would often have a ceremonial pole or a ceremonial altar that resembled things that they had in their own rituals, and they would set it up in that direction. So it's Catholic, but it also has any number of other dimensions to it, too. So. Certainly Catholicism was a piece of that. And that's why some of the people from far away sent their kids all the way to Crow Creek because they did want to have a Catholic education. So that, that is part of it. Other, sir. When you were teaching there, did you have the resources you needed or are they still lacking? Uh, we used to believe so. I know when I went home one summer, I went to my old high school teacher. He gave me some extra sets of books we added in there. I mean, this was very early in the internet age, and I remember one of my friends was the computer teacher. He knew almost nothing about computers, but he could lift them up and put them on a table. Um, and, uh, it, but I mean, so we didn't have a whole lot of resources of what was there. Many schools didn't. We had, I mean, we had decent sets of books that you would see in places. Uh, you know, it's not grand, but I mean, I, I didn't see that as the biggest problem there, but there were, you know, and this is also a private school that had quite a fundraising arm, and it was probably, many would say, the, one of the best funded schools in the region. Comparatively good compared to, you know, going to high school in Edina, I probably guess it's not the same, I don't know, but anyway, so this, uh, there, was, there was a reasonable amount, and, and the, certainly because of the connection to the Jesuits, who were big promoters of education, they made sure of some support for that. So different, different setup there. Other questions, comments people have? Well, I thank you all for your attention. I'll be, I can stick around if you want to answer some others as well. But uh, thanks. Hope you learned something through the process. And uh, enjoy the rest of your night.